Hey there YouTube, it's Bobby aka Paginator and I'm here today with some young adult urban fantasy recommendations. So this topic was suggested to me by one of you all, uh, a subscriber who goes by the name of DG. And they asked a question in, in response to my question and answer um, video that I posted this week. And I'll get to that in a second. And then they also asked for some young adult urban fantasy recommendations. So that's what we're doing today. So first off, um, they did ask if I have any siblings. And yes, I do. I have one brother and one sister. My brother is an engineer and he has four daughters. And my sister is a nurse and she has three sons. All right, so to get to the urban fantasy recommendations, first I wanna just cover like a general definition of what urban fantasy is. It is uh, fantasy stories that are played out in modern settings. Now the, there are like different categories within this if you wanna get super technical, like contemporary versus urban versus like all these different things. But for the most part, it is fantasy stories in a modern setting. With that in mind, I've got a pile of books here to, to um, go through for you. And we're going to start with the number one recommendation, at least in my mind, of an author for urban fantasy. And that is the lovely and amazing and beautiful and all good things, Miss Cassandra Clare. The first series that she wrote, which is what really introduced me to urban fantasy is the City of Bones or Mortal Instruments series. City of Bones is the first book. As we go through this video, we're gonna be seeing some books with labels on them because they came from my classroom. Yes, I actually hauled them from my classroom here for this video. You're welcome. Actually, it's a gift to me so I don't have to slide in pictures of every single one of them that aren't here. Anyway. This is the story of a young woman named Clary Frey who is in the city out in a club one night and she accidentally witnesses the murder of a fairy and she's not supposed to have seen that. She sees three teenagers with odd markings and she soon comes to learn that they are um, members of a group who are called shadow hunters and they hunt down like dark creatures like demons and things like that um they also help kind of wrangle werewolves and vampires if they're causing problems for humans and shadow hunters are a part angel there is one particular shadow hunter who Claire thinks is quite handsome his name is jace Wayland, and he can be kind of a jerk sometimes but really we like him and we learn more about jace as we go through the series in addition to Clary and all these things. And Clary also learns that not only are there such things as shadow hunters, but she's actually technically part of this world. And I'm not going to tell you how because I don't want to spoil it for anybody who's interested in reading this series, but there you go. Um, for each one of these books, I'm also going to be telling you what the Goodreads rating is and the Amazon age recommendation. So for this one, it has a Goodreads rating of 4.09 out of 5, which I think is really good. Anything in the 3 and 4 range to me suggests that it's a pretty decent read, especially when you get up into the 4s. And for a book that came out so many years ago, like I think this one came out in 09, to be at a 4.09 in Goodreads is pretty amazing. And the age recommendation from Amazon is 14 plus. More from Cassandra Clare. We have Clockwork Angel. This is the first book in the Infernal Devices series. And this one is also crossing the line into like kind of steampunky st kind of stuff because we do go historically um, back in time. And we also have some interesting technology, which is kind of what makes steampunk history plus technology equals steampunk. But our main character in this one is Tessa Gray, and she is looking for her brother in Victorian England. And she ends up meeting a couple of young men who are parabatized, which in the world of the Shadow Hunters is like very closely bonded partners that work together like a brotherhood. Um, and we have, um, oh, I'm losing my thoughts. What's the thing? The Magister. 
a shadowy figure who's like running this club, the Pandemonium Club, and he is really wanting to claim Tessa's power for his own. And we're not entirely sure exactly if Tessa's a shadow hunter in the first book or like what exactly she is. But as you read the trilogy, then you learn more about what she is. But there's also a love triangle because these two Parabatai, Jem and Will, um, there's a conflict between Tessa and which guy is she going to pick. I have my preferences. I'm team Jem, but I know that many people are team Will, and that's all right because we're Americans and allowed to have our own opinions. The Goodreads rating for this book is a 4.31, and it is also an age rating of 14 plus. All right, so I do want to clarify something. Because the Clockwork Angel book does take us back in time, I still, when it decided to put it in as urban fantasy because it's part of the Shadowhunter world, which is all very urban fantasy. Does that make sense? Okay. Moving on, we have one more Cassie Clare, and that is Lady Midnight. This is the first in the Dark Artifices trilogies, and full disclosure, I haven't read this one yet. I have a thing with Cassie Clare books, like, if there's a duology or a trilogy or whatever, I have to read them all at once because otherwise I drive myself insane, and I just haven't set aside time to get through the Dark Artifices. I do have all three of them in the matching paperback with the spines that sit together beautifully, but... When do I have time to read? <laughs> That's one of the going to be the, one of the greatest gifts of being done with graduate school in a year is having more time to read, and I'm super excited about it. <laughs> but anyway, Lady Midnight. Um, this has a Goodreads rating of 4.38 and is also rated 14 plus for age. And I'm going to read one paragraph from the back of the book just to help us all understand more about the story. Emma Carstairs is a shadow hunter, the best in her generation. Together with her parabatai, Julian Blackthorne, she patrols the streets of Los Angeles where fairies, the most powerful of supernatural creatures, teeter on the edge of open war with shadow hunters. When bodies, both fairy and human, turn up bearing marks that match those found on Emma's own murdered parents, an uneasy alliance is formed. This is Emma's chance for revenge and Julian's chance to get back his brother, a prisoner of the fairy courts. All they have to do is solve the murders within two weeks and before the murderer targets them. So, again, this idea of parabatize and, like, partners working together comes up in this series. And we see it throughout the all of the series, including the Mortal Instruments. It's a very cool idea. I, I like that a lot. All right, we're going to step out of the world of Cassie Clare and into the world of the amazing Maggie Steve Fodder. This is the first book in the Raven Cycle, The Raven Boys. Look at the cover of this. This is the British edition. Isn't that so pretty? Oh, this has a Goodreads rating of 4.04, .04, and the age recommendation from Amazon is 13 to 17. This is about Blue, and she's been told that her true love is going to die if she ever kisses him. But even so, she wants to stay away from boys because she's just, like, so not into the boy-girl drama at school. Um, there's a local private school, and some of the boys there are known as the Raven Boys, and she knows that they mean trouble. As we read on one of the lines on the back of the book, it tells us, but this is the year that will change everything for Blue. This is the year she will be drawn into the strange and sinister world of the Raven Boys, and the year Blue will discover that magic does exist. This is the year she will fall in love. There are some really interesting characters. We have a group of four boys that Blue interacts with and get, kind of gets pulled into their circle of friends. And there are some absolutely beautifully written moments and some heartbreaking moments and some funny things and it's so hard for me to tell you more about this without spoiling things, so maybe I'll just move on to the next book. Next we have the Vampire Academy series. So the first one is simply called Vampire Academy, and this is a series by Rochelle Mead. Uh, this first book is rated 4.11 on Goodreads, and the age recommendation is 12 to 15. I think 16, 17, 18-year-olds would probably enjoy this too if they're into vampires. So this is urban fantasy in that it's a modern setting, but we do have paranormal creatures, vampires, at this academy. And um, our character here, Lissa Dragomir, is a Maroi princess, um, which is a mortal vampire with a gift for harnessing the Earth's magic. Um, and there's another group of vampires called the Strigoi. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but they're the ones who never die. And... Lissa and Rose, her best friend, are attending Vampire Academy, and 
Rose is, like, dedicated to protecting Lissa from the Strigoi. And the Strigoi really want Lissa to be one of them. So there's uh, some interesting power dynamics at play here. We also start getting introduced to love interests in this book. And so if you're kind of, like, feeling nostalgic for some Twilight vampire romance, but aren't ready to, like, pick up Twilight, because it is a pretty dang big book. Give this one a try. Um, we have definitely paranormal romance as part of this, and it's set, the school is actually in the forests of Montana, so representation for the Big Sky State, which is a gorgeous place, by the way. My sister used to live there, and oh, mind-blowing how gorgeous that state is. Up next, we have one that has been sitting on my shelves for a while, and I just haven't got to it, so... I can't tell you a whole lot about this one, but this is Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lainey Taylor. This is the first book in a trilogy, and this book has a 4.0 rating, and the age recommendation is 14+. plus. The back of the book tells us um, this is a sweeping and gorgeously written modern fantasy about a forbidden love, an ancient and epic battle, and hope for a world remade. And... That's really all I know. I should have been a better YouTuber and done more research about this book, but that's all I can tell you. Pretty cover, cool blue feathery mask, Daughter of Smoke and Bone. Lainey Taylor, I can tell you I've read other books by her. She's a beautiful writer, so I don't know that you could really go wrong trying out this series, even though I know nothing about it. Next, we have Modern Fairy Tales by Holly Black. This is a bind-up of two fairy tales i think tithe and valiant no there's three ironside is also in here quite a pretty cover um so you can see there's a bookmark in here i started reading tithe a while ago and i kind of got stuck so it's going to be one of those books that i'm going to come back to later but this is um a modern fairy tale it's about a girl named Kay, and she la she saves the life of a strange injured young man in the woods near her New Jersey home and that is going to change her life. She's going to be pulled into this world um, where she becomes like a pawn in this power struggle between ancient magical forces and there's like two fairy kingdoms that are rivals and she like her life is at risk in this conflict all for saving someone's life like what look what good deeds get you. Holly Black is the queen of fairies. She is definitely a go-to author. When I was looking up titles for Urban Fantasy, it suggested that her Cruel Prince series would be Urban Fantasy. Um, it does begin in the modern world, but almost immediately we're taken into the fae world, and it's completely different, so I don't know if I would 100% pick it for, for Urban Fantasy, but this one definitely fits in that genre. This next one, I kind of went back and forth in my mind. Should I recommend this one or not? Um, this is Marked. This is the first book in the House of Night series. And I did decide to tell you guys about it. And you can do with this information what you will. So this is by PC Cast and Kristen Cast. They're a mother-daughter writing team, which is kind of a fun thing. And it is uh, Vampires. This is um, in a world where, pe where people know vampires exist. And there are schools called The House of Night, and this one is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we our, our stories take place. And we center around a girl named Zoe Redbird, who is marked for The House of Night, meaning she will become a vampire as long as she survives the transformation. You get marked um, as a new vampire, and then when you fully transform into an actual vampire, you get, like, a tattoo on your forehead and, like, at, like, Interesting, crazy things happen, we'll say. Um, but Zoe kind of builds up this squad of friends, and they call themselves the Nerd Herd, which I love. Zoe is Native American, and so there are some elements of Native American folklore and magic that get woven into this world, as well as the vampire stuff, which is pretty fun. Um, my, my concern with this is the following. Um, Amazon rates this as an age 12 to 18 age recommendation. I would say no, 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 and I'll tell you why. Um, I would go maybe 16 plus, maybe 15, depending on the maturity of the 15-year-old. Here's why. 
within a very short time in just the first book in the series, we already have oral sex. There's a lot of sexy times that happen through this series. I don't have this one in my classroom for that reason. I did originally put a label on it, but then I was like, you know what? This is not okay. I'm no. So yes, there's a label on it, but it doesn't actually live in my classroom. It lives on my shelf right up there along with the rest of the series. I do enjoy reading the series for myself, but my kiddos that I teach are 12 to 14 and I would say no, not on this. Um, it does have a good reads rating of 3.80. Did I tell you the rating for Tithe? It's 3.72 with an age recommendation of 14 plus. So if I didn't already say that, there you go. Up next we have Beautiful Creatures by Cami Garcia and Margaret Stahl. This has a Goodreads rating of 3.76 and the Amazon age rating is 12 plus. I really like this series. It's definitely urban fantasy. It's paranormal romance and the protagonist is a male. Like most of these books, we get female protagonists, so it's fun to have a boy telling the story. This is about Ethan, who lives in this southern town called Gatlin, and he kind of falls for this girl named Lena, who is basically a witch. I forget the name that they use. Caster, I think. Um, this was adapted into a movie. The movie was okay. Um, I was, like, pleasantly satisfied with it but wasn't in love with the movie adaptation but um, basically we find out in this southern town in Gatlin there is a historical power struggle within the caster world and Lena is going to be chosen for their light or dark power. I can't remember if light or dark is the words they use but basically good or evil she's going to be joining one of those sides and Ethan um, really just does not enjoy living in this small town but then he meets Lena and he's very drawn to her and determined to uncover this connection between the two of them. Um, Lena also has a cousin named Ridley who is fantastic. She's a foil for Lena so they are opposites in a lot of ways but she's also like deliciously evil and like I just love her. She's one of those great villain characters and there's actually a book or maybe two books that are written from Ridley's point of view which is really fun. Next we have one that I don't know if I would classify as either YA or middle grade. It kind of toes the line between the two of them and look at this poor beat up copy of this book. We've got rips here like this whole chunk has been ripped out of the back dust jacket. So many kids have read this book that it's just, it's been through the ringer. But it is Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children by Ransom Riggs. There are, I think, five books in the series now. I can't remember. Um, there's also a movie, movie adaptation of this one. But it is um, a modern setting and then quickly moves into the strange and paranormal and fantasy. Um, our main character is Jacob, who's 16. And Amazon recommends this for ages 8 to 12, but I think you could go older for the reader on this one. Um, the Goodreads rating is 3.91. Jacob has always been told stories of this interesting home for peculiar children and shown pictures of these strange kids that go there. And in the book, we get pictures of them also. For example, there's a girl who's so light that she just will float away unless you tie her down. Um... And Jacob's grandfather is brutally attacked and he's going through some trauma and really wants to go to Wales where this school was supposedly at and see if he can find it and help himself find some answers to what happened to his grandfather and maybe find the school for peculiar children. So this next book I had to go to the school library and check out because I gave away my copy ages ago. This is Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. Um, the, this whole series is urban fantasy because we have kids in a modern setting who then get involved in fantastical elements to do with mythology, Greek mythology specifically. And then Rick Riordan also has other series with um, Egyptian mythology and I think Roman and I can't remember what else, but he's written tons and tons of these kind of books. But this is the OG of this of his work. Um, I gave away 
almost all of my Rick Riordan books a few years ago because I couldn't get kids to check them out anymore. And there was one student who was absolutely in love with them. And I was like, you know what? Just take them home. He was so excited. It was awesome. <laughs> um, anyway, this one, if you're not familiar, is about Percy, who doesn't know it yet, but finds out that he is the half-son of Poseidon. And he gets sent to Camp Half-Blood, where all these other half-children of Greek gods go to train. And he encounters all different kinds of strange things. Someone has stolen Zeus's lightning bolt. And... Percy, he of course has to find and return Zeus's stolen property because that's the only way to bring peace to Mount Olympus. And we start off in New York City and find out that that's kind of where Mount Olympus is, but it has moved through around the world through generations. And uh, one of his friends, Annabeth, she's a super great character. Um, I just love her. And we have like satyrs and we have all different kinds of characters. Uh, creatures and characters from Greek mythology. So that's Percy Jackson and the Olympians, book one, The Lightning Thief. Did I tell you the ratings on that one? Goodreads, 4.26, and Amazon age recommendation is 10 to 14 for Percy Jackson. Up next, we have Wicked Lovely by Marissa Marr, and this is another one that I brought from school. Um, look at that, like, frosty covered flower. That's pretty. All right, so this one, um, there are, Tamora Pierce is the author, and there are rules in this world. Don't stare at invisible fairies. Don't speak to invisible fairies. Don't attract their attention. And our main character, Aislinn, has always seen fairies. She knows that they are powerful and dangerous, and that they walk hidden in our world. But... Um, the rules that she's always followed that I mentioned kind of stop working for her and everything is suddenly on the line. She's potentially going to lose her freedom, her best friend, Seth, her life, everything. So we've got fairy intrigue and the back of the book tells us we've also got mortal love and the clash of ancient rules and modern expectations. So another modern fairy tale kind of story here. This one is rated 3.69 on Goodreads and Amazon suggests the age of 13 to 17. Up next is Sisters Read by Jackson Pierce. I adore this book. I am a sucker for anything like Red Riding Hood like related and look at this we've got Red and a wolf and could it get more cool? I don't think so. The tagline says, who's afraid of the big bad werewolf? So Sisters Red has a Goodreads rating of 3.63 with an age recommendation of 15 plus. I do let my middle schoolers read this one because I feel like there are some YA elements in here, but it's okay for them to read. Um, so we have two sisters, Scarlet and Rosie, and they are werewolf hunters. In this book, the werewolves are called Fenris. Um, and... Scarlet lost her eye in a Fenris attack years before. Um, they always wear red cloaks and they hunt with hatchets. So it is a very like Red Riding Hood, super vibey retelling-ish kind of story. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the back. It says, yet even as the Fenris seem to be gaining power, Rosie dreams of life beyond the wolves. She finds herself drawn to Silas, a young woodsman who is lethal with an axe and is Scarlet's only friend. But does loving him mean betraying her sister and all that they have worked for? Another thing you should know about Fenris in this book is they go after a lot of young women. So these girls are really showing some sisterhood and girl power by hunting down the Fenris. Up next, we have one of the best books I've read in a long time. This is Burn by Patrick Ness, and it came out fairly recently in 2020. Um, this is, you can see there's a dragon on the cover. This book is complicated. Before I get into that, let me just kind of give you the, the stats. The Goodreads um, rating is 3.80, and the age recommendation is 13 to 17. In this book, I made a handy character list for my kiddos who check it out because there's a lot of people. So Sarah is our main character, and she's a biracial farm girl. We have Gareth, her father, Jason, her BFF, and more. Casimir, who is a dragon. Agents Wolf and Durnovich, who are federal agents. 
Malcolm, an assassin who thinks he's a hero. This is very dangerous. Nelson, Malcolm's friend slash possible boyfriend. And Materathea, the head of a dragon worshiper cult. So we have cults, we have federal agents, we have dragons, we have assassins, we have farm kids, we've got racial issues because this is 1957 and Sarah is of Japanese descent. No, she's not. Her friend is of Japanese descent. She is biracial from a black parent and a white parent, if I remember right. Anyway. They're farmers and they've kind of become outcasts because of her biracial status and they have to hire a dragon on their farm which is seen as like oh my gosh they're getting desperate they have to hire a dragon. I think that would be like the ultimate cool thing. I have a dragon on my farm but in this world it's not cool but Casimir is the dragon who comes to the farm to work and all her life Sarah's been told that dragons are soulless laborers but this dragon's very protective of Sarah and really looks out for her in some dangerous situations. We also find out that there is a prophecy involved um, with Casimir and potentially Sarah as well. And there is a deputy sheriff, Kelby, who is a lying sack of garbage, racist piece of doo-doo. Like, hate this man. And he comes into play a lot. Now, I'm going to tell you one other thing that... that um, pops up later in the book. Parallel dimensions. So even though this is set in 1957, I still classify this as urban fantasy because the 1950s aren't that far ago. In the past, we still have a good share of modern technology. It's not internet, of course, you know, but a lot of things that we have now. And it is such a stunning example of taking paranormal elements and setting them into a modern like normal realistic functioning society and all of a sudden bam we have dragons and cults and all kinds of crazy things happening i highly highly recommend this book like i said it's one of the best books i've read in a long long time i adore it and i lent it to one of my co-workers and she read it and then i think she had her husband read it and maybe one of her kids read it before i got it back so it's just, oh, it's so fantastic. Mm. All right. I do have one other book to tell you about, and this is the last book on my list. It's also one I haven't read yet because I haven't bought it yet. It's sitting in my Amazon cart, and I keep telling myself to not buy any more books for a while, but I was listening to Marissa Meyer's Happy Writer podcast, and she did an episode with the author L.L. McKinney, and I am so intrigued by the premise of this book. So let me tell you about it. It is A Blade So Black, and again, the author is L.L. McKinney. This is the first book in a series. It has a Goodreads rating of 3.70 and an age recommendation of 14 to 18. So this one is like an Alice in Wonderland retelling, but there's like other elements mixed in and like the author is a big fan of Sailor Moon, so the main character is like a Sailor Moon cosplayer, and so that's kind of fun. I am going to pull this one up on Amazon so we can read the description. All right, so before we read the description, I will let you know there's also this, the second book is out now. A Dream So Dark is the title of that one, but I am going to read the description or synopsis on the first book, A Blade So Black, and it is described as follows. The first time the nightmares came, it nearly cost Alice her life. Now she's trained to battle monstrous creatures in the dark realm known as Wonderland with magic weapons and hardcore fighting skills, yet even warriors have a curfew. Life in real-world Atlanta isn't always so simple, as Alice juggles an overprotective mom, a high-maintenance best friend, and a slipping GPA. Keeping the nightmares at bay is turning into a full-time job, but when Alice's handsome and mysterious mentor is poisoned, she has to find the antidote by venturing deeper into Wonderland than she's ever gone before. And she'll need to use everything she's learned in both worlds to keep from losing her head, literally. This is just so, like, this book is made for me, I feel like. I love Alice in Wonderland. I read so many retellings of it as well, and it's, like... Oh, my phone's ringing in the other room. I'll call them back. Anyway, gosh, that's annoying. 
let me close the door. So that brings us to the end of this video of YA urban fantasy recommendations. And I have to say that some of the books that I mentioned that I haven't read yet are like creeping higher on my TBR because gosh, like it seems kind of fun to just think about diving into a fantasy world for a little while. So let me know in the comments below if you've read any of these and if you enjoyed them. Um, as for my subscriber who asked for this video, DG, I hope this helps and I hope you're able to get some good recommendations out of this list. And I hope you guys all have a wonderful, magical, and bookish day. Happy reading. Adios.